Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk. I can't pronounce all the words, so we'll skip that bit. Uh, so, my name is Mark, and I've worked for, as Danny said, agencies since about 1998. And then from 2010, I had my own company, Incendiary Blue. So, over that time, I formed and managed, led many teams, and worked with many people. So, it's that 25 years of experience that are in this talk today, really. I just want to say, don't panic. Um, these views are my own, and you may not agree. But as I always say in my talks, I might just be right. I'm normally right. So what will we cover today? Well, first of all, a very small bit on creativity and innovation, how I'm going to define it. How can you, you can incorporate that into your work and your teams, my experience in trying to do it, things that just go wrong, and how to fix them. So what am I hoping? Well, I'm hoping you're going to take some actionable things away from this talk. I'm hoping you're going to be able to form the right team, get the right ideas into that team, make sure things progress when you do that, and enjoy the process along the way. That's one of the most important things. There are a few random thoughts. They were dotted around, but now they're at the end, so I'm hoping we get to those. So firstly, what is creativity and innovation with regards to this talk? Creativity is the generation of new ideas, and innovation, to me, is the implementation of those ideas. And the important thing is, this was said earlier as well, they're non-obvious would be best. What it definitely isn't, and what most companies make a mistake of doing, is just embracing the latest trends for the sake of it. And what I will say is, if you have an idea, don't keep it to yourself. You just need to share it. If you keep that idea to yourself, it has zero value. It's worthless, and it will always be worthless. And I seriously cannot think about any idea I've had when I'm just sitting at my desk. So who is creative? I think, personally, we all have the ability to be creative, and some of us have a real natural talent. They're just geniuses. That's just the way it is. But most people you can nurture, but only if they're passionate, and they're passionate about the learning. And it's the people with passion that you want to hurt, harness and encourage. And you really do need to encourage them daily. This isn't about encouraging them at a you know, quarterly review with some crap objectives. You know, this is about encouraging what they're doing whilst they're learning, suggesting things to them. So, becoming creative, all very zen. I think uh, one of the key things to encourage people to be creative, as I said, I don't think of anything at my desk, is just to go out there for walks, galleries, TED Talks, conferences, mindfulness, if you will, and a lot of people and spaces watching. Just taking in what you see, you know, laughing at certain things you see. And when you're doing that, I, I prefer a pad um, if I write down ideas. Like, I don't really want to be on my phone. I have blockers on there like Freedom VPN so that it blocks everything out so I can't be bothered. I turn my phone off. I do all sorts of things. I've even got these headphones, uh, like builders ones, to cut all noise out. But I, I looked back for this talk for a little book I had from around 2004, and there were some good ideas in it. I hadn't done anything with them, so they were worthless. And also, you find silly ideas as well. There was one. I obviously had my daughter then, and uh, it was about a car seat rocker. And I'd drawn a little lever on it so I didn't have to bend over, and I would seriously have launched the girl into space. Uh, so some of them aren't so good, but they're worth looking back on. Something I recommend, and this is really important, go for it, Mario and arcade games. Right? These are the best things to wipe your mind. Right? I challenge anyone to try playing Mario Karts against four to eight people and thinking about anything but Mario Karts. Right? These are brilliant every day. A few other games, Boomerang Fu, Towerfall, Micro Machines, anything that's around 15 minutes. You can do them a couple of times a day. You can get your team involved. Anyone can play because they've got handicapping systems. So when someone's falling behind, they get more power-ups and stuff like that. But the most important thing is, when you're having stress, have a game. Right? But not like Call of Duty or something like that. It's going to take forever. You're like Mario Kart, seriously. During um, COVID, anyone who didn't have a Switch, I bought a Switch and sent it to them so we could do Mario Karts. We had iPads set up with videos. Great fun. Still do it. 
Right, so what about implanting space for that creativity? Well, a number of companies have tried this. You've got Google, obviously. 20%. Um, that wasn't a new idea. I believe, there's um, a Google talk later, it was influenced from 3M from around 1945, who did 15%. And out of that came products, Gmail, AdSense, Google News, to name a couple that you've obviously heard of. The BBC allegedly do 10%, Apple X weeks a year, Atlassian still do 20%. But do they really? Right, so there are comments from people coming out of Google saying 20% is dead, it's more like 120% time. So I'm sure you can read into it what that is. I said about sharing your ideas earlier and not keeping them to yourself, but it is worth noting intellectual property rights. If you're working for someone, they probably own your IP if you have that idea. But if you don't share it, it goes nowhere and you can get glory from that idea. So what about side projects? These are my favorite um, because they're normally driven by real personal interest and you have really high levels of enthusiasm if someone has a side project. They can get quite deep in their exploration, but there is a danger. They can have really lofty goals. Um, you tend to find people have delusions of grandeur, like they're gonna be the next gazillion uh, pound special app. And that's not often the case, but you do have to support those and plan for when that enthusiasm wears off. And then you can continue. And up here, you can see this little energy, energy thing. And what tends to happen if you don't keep it in the right direction, it just goes all over the place. And, and, and there's no progress. And we'll come to progress later. What about the idea of a genius hour? Now, genius hours are actually attributed to school. There's a, some schools who did this, and they gave students an hour to do whatever they wanted, and it wasn't marked. And I think this has got a really good crossover with walks, gallery time, and stuff like that. So you could implement, in effect, a creativity hour. And you can give this to a lot of people. You know, uh, I'm going to come to some initiatives that really are for fewer people, but this is a good one for everyone. What I wouldn't do, like, um, I'd do genius hour, if you like creativity hour, instead of training. Training, in my opinion, sorry, is shit, right? I hate it unless it's mentoring, right? I think it should be this type of event you go to where you get to think and talk to people, watch TED Talks and stuff like that. Training is devised normally for the slowest person in the room, right? I've written training courses, I've given training courses, it is the case. I hate them because I'm always the quickest person in the room, maybe. So what have I tried? Well, I've tried a few of these things. 20% time from an agency point of view, impossible, right? You just can't get the buy-in, never gonna happen. So I implemented what I called dev days and UX days, where you can give a number of your developers one day a month to do something. It, it works to a degree, but it's quite slow going. Very hard to protect that time. Um, because if you're in a consultancy or agency, what you tend to find is people say, oh, can you just do this for me? And people don't like saying no. So you've got your UX person who will then do some work on a project. They won't put their time against that project, makes the project look more profitable. And what you're losing is this creativity and innovation time. A much better way of doing it in a company is to do a one week build. Uh, it benefits more people, but not everyone. So you, there is a degree of jealousy, uh, but then you've got like a little hackathon where you can come up with multiple ideas. It's actually quite easy to implement, um, especially after the first time, because ideas do get generated. And in my own company, we've had little side projects that have come out of this. One was Weather Cows, and you can go on the um, iTunes App Store, and you can download Weather Cows. This came out of my creative director coming in on the train, and every time a cow was lying down, he'd tweet, you know, it's gonna rain. Right, so we did Weather Cows with little animations and fun, just to be fun. We then got a little bit carried away because we did do a book that's on Amazon and started getting T-shirts printed, and we thought we were gonna have some sort of a theme park at one point. Um, we did one called QQ during COVID, which was virtual queuing, Q for anything, uh, and also for food. Um, did you do a workflow management system? What a fucking disaster, to be quite honest. I let the devs go on and on and on, and we never used it, pathetic. Um, but then they did do one called Pi Slice, which was using Raspberry Pi and, and technology to, to blast different adverts to different screens. And that was pretty cool. But all of these things had learnings. So, you know, that all sounded good, didn't it? So, you know, but why do companies fail? As I said, I've been doing this for like 23 years and I, I assure you it's not all rosy. Um, it can become an afterthought or just something to say. You can get the ideas just handed to you and there's a lack of belief in the team. 
One of the most important things is people are just not good enough. Like, it's sad but true but, that not everyone is good enough to get involved in these initiatives and they can kill it a bit. And the other problem is it can just be used as time off work. So I've made all these mistakes, great news for you, as they can all be fixed and mitigated against. Um, I do warn you, it's going to take continued effort and uh, policing. That's the important thing. So how do you fix it's just something to say? Um, one of the harder ones to fix is when you just get told, we just need to be creative. And it's the same as saying, we just need to be agile. And a lot of the time, people use it to mean, we just work harder, just work harder, be creative. You can't just do that. Um, it's not creative at all, won't lead to anything. As I said, it's quite hard to fix, and it's hard to fix because it involves you as an individual. When anyone tells, tells you to just be creative, you should really ask for more information, challenge them, ask them for solutions, try and give them solutions, because it doesn't help to leave it. If you continually just get told to be creative, you're going to get aggravated, and the person who's saying it is never going to learn, and they're often above you, so um, do challenge them. It can often be just something to say in recruitment, and it, you'll go to a, an interview and they'll portray it as it's a reality, but really, it's just a dream. And I think it's much better to be honest because you're going to find out after a couple of weeks of work that it, it wasn't true what they were saying. So say something like, you know, we're lucky, um, we want to create a culture of creativity and innovation, and we need people like you to help. What can you bring to the team? And now you've got a question instead. All right, I did take this slide out, snip, snip, um, but as it's there, this was me not very happy with the last answer I gave where you've got to challenge, and I was trying to come up with ways of challenging. <laughs> so marshmallow punishment, I thought, right, if anyone mentions the word creativity without a backup, you start chucking marshmallows at them. There were a few problems with this. Um, number one, they might really like marshmallows. I'd be all over it. I'd go for like Skittles or something and just be collecting them. Uh, they might want a little barbecue, something like that, to, to roast that marshmallow. But it does have serious points as well. Um, Think square jar, you know, where people used to put a pound in. When, when we started the company, we had an HR jar. And because we didn't have an HR person. And every time someone says something dubious, it, you know, someone called them out on it and it went in the HR jar. And at Christmas, we got these out and named and shamed. It was utterly embarrassing. But there is a point to it, like, because there, there is a, a psychological um, effect with keep on repeating something back to someone. And that psychological effect, it, it, you, you know, they don't want to be challenged on it. And so the idea of maybe this creative jar or something where you put in, you said creative here and you had no idea what you were talking about on these dates and playing back to people could work. It definitely worked with the HR jar. We don't have it anymore. And I could see behavioral change from it. Right, we're back on track. It's all okay. Um, so how to fix people aren't good enough. Right, just wanting to be involved in the coolest initiative in the company is not good enough for entry, right? And just because you're in charge of a department doesn't mean you should be there, right? Um, the only thing you really want on these teams is people who've got passion, plus you think they're smart and get things done, right? And I say smart and get things done on purpose. There's a guy called Joel Spolsky, and some of the developers here, there are a few, you might have heard of him, I might be showing my age a bit, and he came up with an interview process, and really you just interview for smart and get things done, and you either hire them or you don't. There's no maybe, a maybe is a no. And I think this is a really good way, and this is how I employ people from my company, but uh, to get people onto these teams, because otherwise you get death by mediocrity. You, you're dead before you start. You're never going to be creative or innovative. So have a barrier to entry. Maybe there's a, an interview question. A better idea is like Dragon's Den, right? You basically say, we're going to start up this venture, but you've got to come with an idea. You've got five minutes to present it. You get some people involved. You do a little Dragon's Den board. It's really good fun. You can do it in like half a lunch hour or a break during the day. And then they're the people you pick to come onto your team when they've got a good idea. Because what they're showing is they care. They've got an idea. They've thought about it. They're willing to put in the effort to, to create something to get on this team. And also then these people can be evangelists for the team, scouts for talent in the larger companies. Now, if you're going to give an idea, right, it's really important to make sure it's well thought out. Because otherwise, you won't have any belief there'd be a complete failure. Um, I'm sure, well, I have, I'm sure you've all been on projects where you know it's going to fail, right? Or you know it's rubbish, but you've got someone who's just saying, we've just got to get this done, it has to be done by this certain date, and, right, and everyone sort of plods 
like towards doom. Um, and that's not really what you, you, you want to get here. So brainstorm the ideas, like I told you, with Dragon's Den. If you want to involve the bigger company, get it on postcards, you know, get people to email in. A lot of the things that people send are pretty rubbish, but there are always some gems in there, you know, some real insights, and invite those people to present their idea, right, so you, they can prove how good it is. So how do you take the best ideas forward? Well, I love planning poker. It comes from like agile development, stuff like that. And you get a set of cards. Here's a number sequence. They're not one to 10. Uh, normally this or a Fibonacci sequence. So how do you use them? So let's think, we've had our little Dragon's Den session and we've got these ideas. A number of you sit around the table and you play a card. You can only use each card once. So say there are five ideas. I might put down 100. I really like that idea. Someone might put down two and you've got some other random numbers. And what you need to do is the person who put down the 100 and the person who put down the one, the ones furthest apart, you get them to justify why they've done it. And once they've justified, you vote again. And you'll have a, a point score, if you will. If you do that for each idea, you can do it really quickly, right? You, you'll end up with points against each idea and you know potentially which one to go forward with. It's a bit like having an inbuilt devil's advocate, right, but rather than having the person there. So what do you do with all these ideas? You've got a list of them, you've done planning poker, you can do t-shirt sizing, and what you wanna do is start with the success of it. You can do more than one idea, but seriously, one when you're starting out is best. So how do you track them? Well, you can create a simple Kanban board, just backlog doing review done. That's good enough, put it in Trello, put it in anything you want really. Uh, you can add notes and deadlines, but the key is the person doing the work is responsible for the task. No one else is responsible for that task. They have to show progress. At this point, you don't need a project manager. They literally suck all the life out of the room, right? Absolutely <laughs> fucking awful. Sorry, I'm allowed to swear on this. Uh, so you've just got to let people shine, really, because everyone on these teams should be good enough, right? They should be good enough to track their own time. They know what a process is. Look, it's not exactly difficult, is it? I might have lied a little. Those poor little PMs, eh? Bless them. Uh, I was a bit overly mean, because you do need them at some point, obviously. Like when the ideas are grown and it's become a bit more medium or large, you might need some more time to get the work done, you don't want it to end up like that dev day I was telling you about that never moves on. And also you're gonna need some internal, at least marketing skills, someone who is able to support the idea, get the budget for it, you know. Uh, some of those ideas I mentioned before we've done, the reason they've really not, not going anywhere, I'm just interested in the initial idea and just getting it done, I don't like the marketing bit. Um, but you do need that if you want to get somewhere. I'm sure that Gmail, AdSense, etc., wouldn't have got there otherwise. So what you're thinking is you're starting in the garage, and when you're out of the garage, you need some controls. So this Dangers in People is your biggest chance of failure, 100%. It can just end up as time off work. It can end up as time to complete other projects or budgets, um, warts can end up as a phone call to families, friends, gas companies, and the only real way to fix it is regular catch-ups and calling out issues. It's a bit like when the person who said, hey, just be creative, right? You need to challenge and have honest conversations. What tends to happen is on these initiatives, you end up with the best people in the company, right? And the most, the people that, other people think they're great, and you can't shy away from telling them they're not or they're not doing the job um, because things need to move on. And you need to take people off of these teams if they're not doing, doing the right job because you need to keep them rich. Okay. So I could say now it's time we've covered a lot quite quickly. You should be well equipped. You should be able to really create the right teams, get some ideas, move forward and make a difference. So I could say thank you now, but before I go, I've just got a couple of things I'd like to talk about. Um, I always, as like I said, when you're walking around, take pictures of things and look at stuff. But this is my, my favorite thing I've seen recently. Yeah, condom machine. I've actually had the snip, so it's irrelevant for me. But anyway, uh, it's uh, got a share, haven't you? Uh, this is in, in Verona in a unisex toilet. Um, and what's interesting about this is I should have pressed the button a while ago, so not to bore you. But all around this is pictures of people getting married. 
So it could mean nothing or it could mean something else, right? So I think this is an amazing behavioral nudge to, as you're going into the, the restaurant, you've had a lot of drinks and it's like, uh, unless you want to get married, best get that condom. Uh, but they could have done it to something else. But I do like things like this. I think they make you think, right? So I also said, um, don't keep ideas to yourself, right? So loads of people could have the same idea as me, you know, thousands of people, it's only the ones who innovate. So here's a little idea for mine that I had. Right, so the NHS has 570 million-ish interactions in 2022. So what if every interaction with your GP, getting blood, having an X-ray, was a pound, right, and, and you took a pound. Okay, how would we collect it? We'll come to that. I'm saying a little square device, something like that, but we'll come back to it. What if every interaction, someone gave five pounds, which isn't too expensive, right? It's only a little bit more than your Starbucks uh, or Costa. There are other places, I just don't like Costa. Um, but the cost for NHS per day is around 285 million. I've cheated for easy maths here, right? Because that's about 10 days. And you think, oh God, Mark, well done. You've managed to fund the NHS for 10 days. Um, but that's not really the point. I am not trying to fund the whole of the NHS. What I'm trying to fund is parts of it to make a difference. Maybe get waiting lists down. You can argue um, that it's not enough money to make an impact, in, if you like, but I say, it is, you can make it, I'm sure you can make a difference. And the idea here is to kiss the NHS. Now, I don't know how many people know this acronym. It's like, keep it simple, stupid. A guy told me this when I was on my degree, one of the best developers I've ever met, one of the top three. And I've built a whole career on this, keep it simple, stupid. So let's say we try it in one trust. Let's say we don't have an IBM and a Accenture or people like that sucking up the money for years to get something done. Say we use a square up in each department and you just tap it like you would a busker. I didn't really just make all this up because in Cyprus, they've got a kind of similar system because they went from private healthcare to national healthcare and the private health sector joined. And when you go there, but we were there recently, oh, God, I need to pull that out, that would have been bad, wouldn't it? Um, you, you tap to it was eight euro to see a consultant, five euro for a scan, stuff like that. I know some people can't pay. I know some people just won't pay. But I believe there are many who will. So I've asked a fair few people about this, about 20 to 30 people. I guess they're people I know, so maybe they're a certain type, but they think it's a, a reasonable idea. And I back this up even further because uh, the other Last week, my wife was really unwell and we got the ambulance round and she was being cared for by them. She was on a drip and I thought, yes, this is the time to ask the ambulance crew about my idea. <laughs> she, she was all right. She was only half conscious. What more do you want? So anyway, so we had this little conversation about this and they thought it was a great idea. And funnily enough, they'd had similar ideas, right? So the ambulance crew had said, well, you know, when we go, why don't we have a QR code or a little system so we can say, hey, if you, if you want to donate, to help the NHS, you can. So people have had these ideas. It's about getting them implemented, right? Um, so I think it's really about really like Richard Branson's book. I haven't read the book, but the front cover is screw it, just do it. So what I'm hoping really is because, you know, I'm sharing an idea, maybe someone here hears it, watches it, and decides to do something with it. I'm more than happy uh, to, to get involved and help them. I think that's it. Anyway, so thank you so much for listening. It's been a real pleasure. It's been quite fun up here on stage. And uh, I'll hand you back to Danny. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.